So for most of you, Mark needs no introduction, Mark Fletcher. He's the global um, water leader for Arup, uh, a great supporter, a great supporter of, of IWA Citizens of the Future, um, and um, enormous experience, global experience. But we have really appreciated the support you've given this conference in particular. So you're the last keynote speaker. You, you, um, you got 30 PowerPoints, haven't you? Slides to do? Uh, uh, Something like that? Well, I'll, sh I'll share the story with you. I've spent the last three nights after, after the end of the sessions. I thought, well, each, at the end of each evening, what I'll do is I'll put 10 slides together, maybe 20 points on each slide. We'll do it in black and white. And what I'll do is I'll read them all, OK? So that's, that's 60 slides. So it's, um, it's 60 slides and up to an hour ago, I was getting really excited. I thought, uh, Corinne, she'd trained me. She'd said, you've got to learn everything by heart. Uh, and not only did I learn it by heart, there were rhyming couplets in between the slides. It was fantastic. I was, I was, I was so excited. Um, let's see. And I was uh, so excited and then, um, when I passed my stick across earlier uh, to the IT team, unfortunately, the entire lot has been corrupted. So all the rest of you had had the benefit of slides with bullets, and you know, my name is Mark. You know, and, and it's a prop. So I thought, what do I do? And normally, when I'm stumped like that. And that's what I did first. I got my phone out, went outside, tear coming down my face, and I rang my kids. I said, what do you think I should do? And they said, well, why don't you do what you always did with us when we were little? Why don't you tell a story? I thought, okay, that's a, you know, that's a great idea. I was thinking of Kelly yesterday. She said, why don't we tell stories? But I thought, how am I going to get inspiration for a story? So then I thought, well, Everybody else got their water aid, you know, donation as a gift. But in advance of this presentation, because I might have been rushing off, Corinne, in her wisdom, got me some gifts. So I thought, if I'm going to actually tell a story around something, excuse my balloons, I'll just put those there. Sweden. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll see what I've got. So I've got uh, a few things. I've got, like, an owl. Because uh, it's, it's not very easy telling a story, and these are there's all sort of a bit random. So I'm thinking, how am I going to hang what's happened over the last few days uh, on a pineapple? Okay, and then we got um, here's a couple of Swedish guys here. She said, "Oh, talk about a couple of Swedish guys." So I thought that's a good idea, and um, I'd also got my. It's my postcard. That's my postcard of Gothenburg. There we go. I've got anything left? Oh, yes. And of course, we couldn't have a water conference without a glass of water. So it's from that I will draw the inspiration for my story. <laughs> And if you've ever, ever tried to do this, I think people sometimes do it in interviews and you get five minutes preparation and then you say, go on. But it's very difficult when you put the boot on the other foot. So just to help you, so I'm sure some of you at the back can't quite see my little assortment of gifts. There we go. The owl, the water, the pineapple. So let me try and order these, and I'll just try it. So I'll, let's we'll try and maybe do that one first. I think I've got to do that one last. That one's really, really difficult. Put that one in there. Uh, maybe that one there. And these little guys here. And the other thing I've got to try and do is make it relevant to what we've learnt over the last three days and some of the people who've been here. So I was thinking, so how do I, how do I start my story? So you'll just have to bear with me because I'm sort of uh, making it up as I go along, sort of. <laughs> and in many ways, that's the idea of a story. So if I close my eyes, I'd say, once upon a time, 
there was a family who lived in a wood just near to Gothenburg. And let's call them Eric and Erica. Okay, and Eric, he was a lumberjack, a forester. So he used to live in the woods. And Eric and Erica were blessed. They had uh, twins. Let's call them Sven and Henrik. Henrik, <laughs> what a striking coincidence. So we've now got Henrik. I'll just, stick, I'll just stick one of those in Henrik. Sorry, Henrik. There you go. So um, these twins were identical. They looked the same. You couldn't see any difference with them. They, they grew up in the woods. They uh, played in the trees. They used to swim in the river. They understood the natural infrastructure that they lived within. They understood the way the water cycle as a natural system worked. Now, when they got to the age of 21, their father decided, boys, you've been identical, you've done everything the same, up to this point in life, I'm going to set you a challenge. They said, okay, well, what's, you know, what's the challenge, Dad? And he said, right, I'm going to give you each an axe, same axe. He said, and I've already chopped from my renewable forest two logs about this wide, both of them. Identical logs, you've each got an identical axe. He said, what I'm going to do is when I say go, I want you to start chopping at your logs and we'll see who chops through the first. So they thought, okay, so they sized them. So I, I would have, you know, <laughs> had you given me an axe? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> They each got their axe. And interestingly, they started chopping. And it, it was like a mirror image. They were both chopping in an identical way, with an identical axe, identical log. The father's sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not sure where this is going. <laughs> when suddenly, Henrik, he sat down. And he sat down for 10 minutes. Then he got up and he started chopping again, but still at the same rate as his brother. So Sven's going at it. And then Henrik, 10 minutes later, he sits down again for 10 minutes. Anyway, this goes on. And after two hours, suddenly, there's a crash, a cry of timber. But it was Henrik's log that had crashed and, um, and he had cut through. Sven was still chopping at his log and it was only halfway through. So the father, he was really pleased. He said, That's, this is fantastic. Shake your brother's hand, congratulate him. And son said, I'm not sure I'm going to shake his hand. He said, I've been chopping away continuously for two hours. He keeps sitting down. I don't know what he was doing, but you know, I, I, I've put all the effort in. And he said, so Henrik, what were you doing? And he said, I was sharpening my axe. And his brother looked at him, smiled, shook his hand. They embraced and they learned a lesson. And it's probably a really important lesson. So I was going to say, how many times do we do the same thing again and again and again in the same way and expect a different result and wonder why we don't get it? So um, after that, the boys became even closer than they ever were. And they thought, well, maybe it's time for us to leave the woods and go to the big city. Now, I don't know if you know, but this point in time, we're now at a place where more people live in cities than live in rural areas. So it was very timely, their move. So they go to the big city, and when they get there, they're looking around and they're thinking, well, let's pipes and there's pumps and there's concrete and flat spaces and so they were looking at their water cycle trying to make sense of it given that they were used to nature pools and puddles and and uh, trees and green spaces and then they recognized that not only had the water cycle changed but also 
different elements of it were, men were, were managed by different people. They had different responsibilities. So, and they were quite learned. So they, they understood this term governance. So they said, oh, well, if this water cycle is static, um, we really have to understand the governance if we're going to understand how to manage it better. That's okay, but it's not static. They'd read up about climate change and had recognized that at COP20 in Lima, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change said over 90% of the impacts of climate change will be felt through the water cycle. So they thought that's even more importance for understanding the governance around this water cycle. <coughs> okay. So they also, because they lived in cities, recognized that there were all sorts of other systems, like the system that they really understood around water, like energy, like food, like communications, like transport. And as far as these other systems were concerned, they'd read seen things in places like the World Economic Forum where some of these things appear not as a slice in a pizza, discreetly separate, but they start to overlap like a Venn diagram. And a lot of value could be gained from getting into the sweet spots on the Venn diagram. They talked about, to each other, the food, water, energy nexus, and if you could really get solutions that sat somewhere in the middle. They thought about things like the circular economy. And the other interesting thing about them living in cities is they realized that not only are more people living in cities, but cities are growing and we see the rise of the megacity. So in terms of the megacity, they thought there's Tokyo or there's Mexico or there's Lagos, but there's also Manila and they had an uncle who lived in Manila. And so, one day, they received a postcard from their uncle. Bear with me. And he said, I've been having some troubles with my business. I'd like to invite you over to Manila to come and help me. So they both flew over to Manila. That's, these guys flew over to the Manila. And they met their uncle. And their uncle, he ran a... A, let's, a pineapple farm, okay? <laughs> uh, say that. So he brought them from the airport, took them home, and he said, look, boys, um, we've got problems. And he said, well, what can we do to help? He said, well, I've got a pineapple farm, and we process our pineapples, but we're really, we're, I think we're going to go broke. He said, well, okay, well, why don't you explain it? And they talked about this experience they'd had with this epiphany where they'd suddenly thought about a different way of doing things. So they said, why don't you explain the way in which your farm works? We'll see if we can help. So their uncle said, well, what we do is we pick 250,000 pineapples a day and then we process them. So we, we sort of cut the husks off and they go in the skip and we slice them up into... Um, pineapple rings and pineapple chunks and then we process those they go off to market but then we take those skips and we uh, we have to transport them to the landfill we dump the waste in the landfill and when we dump the waste in the landfill all the waste drops down and methane comes off and we've now heard that that's 20 times more damaging than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas he said my business it's it's almost in ruins what can you do to help? So they said, well, let's bring a few of your operators and your manager and let's just have a bit of a discussion. And they had a discussion and they concluded what we should do is we think we should build like um, a box within your process. And into that box, you'll put all your waste, all the waste bits of your, um, of your pineapples. And we'll use that, we'll cook that up and we'll, instead of that going to landfill, Let's draw that gas off. Use the energy that comes out of that in your plant. Let's make your plant really efficient. And another benefit of that means that no longer do you have to pay for everything to go into the landfill. 
and not, if it's not going into the landfill, then it's not creating these harmful gases. So it's really, it really works. And there's another benefit. That other benefit is this fruity residue that's still got some nutrients in. We'll go and spread that back on your land so you don't have to put fertilizer there. And that was the answer. That was the transformation that made the, the uncle's pineapple processing plant extremely successful. Mr. Mr. Del Monte was his name. And, um, and as there's a sort of a few things I could draw from my little story. I could say that um, I think it's really important that we think laterally, um, that we draw on wisdom where we can. That's the owl. Um, listening to others and working with each other, but really um, having a champion is important. And I'd say that's really important when we think about the governance. And when we think about the governance, I think governance across the water cycle, so water cycle thinking is really important. I think when we think about what we do in cities, we've got to recommend, sorry, we've got to acknowledge that those cities exist within catchments, so things might be happening elsewhere in the catchment in those processes that can help us. And I think anything that we can consider in terms of blue and green infrastructure is not a direct replacement for grey infrastructure. We've got to look at the merits of how we can combine those in the right way. But we need a framework of understanding. IWA provide the framework of understanding. You all provide the knowledge that we all have to share. and. Um, and that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much. I'm very proud to give it.